Um, Hello, welcome to Nurse Practitioners Changing Practice. Uh, we are so happy to have Doug Bolden today with us and very excited for um, all that he brings to this practice. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. Hi, how you doing? Hi, so, ladies. Nice to see you. <laughs> So Doug is one of the initial investors in IMAC. I, I, am I saying that right? IMAC? Yes, yes. IMAC, IMAC and it, it stands for um, Innovative Medical Advancements and Care. Okay. So you're kind of pioneering some really exciting technology uh, with the orthopedics and options that um, nurse practitioners can um, maybe offer their patients. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this and, and yeah. everything that's kind of gone around it. Sure. Well, it, uh, it was the culmination of, of many years of uh, being frustrated with uh, becoming a, uh, a button pusher, as I call it, or um, part of the traditional flow of medicine in today's world where it's important to keep the patient sick all the time. And I struggled with that and whether or not that really made sense. And in the 1990s, when things began to change in healthcare, uh, we had a lot of consolidation and particularly in the St. Louis market uh, with BJC becoming such a giant uh, as well as Mercy and, and St. Luke's and St. Anthony's developing Unity, those entities gained so much power and so many medical providers, physicians included, lost a lot of their independence yes. because everyone was focused on just doing what Medicare or insurance paid for. Yes. And so consequently, we started to have to meet all of these guidelines and criteria for Medicare. And it did make a lot of us button pushers. It was so important to get all of that clinical data to Medicare that everybody had had their flu shot, their pneumonia vax, that everybody had had all of these specific sentinel things checked off of a box. So, you know, with the advent of electronic health records, all of a sudden, it seems like we lost our, our focus on communicating with patients, putting our hands on patients, and we were required to hit all of these buttons and these check boxes in that electronic health record so that whoever we worked for got paid the maximal amount that they could get paid for. Right. I'm all right. about okay. that, and I understand that, but it was frustrating, and so it drove me to start to look at options. So when you, when you say options, Doug, um, you know, as a nurse practitioner, I, I practice in primary care and uh -huh. um, I know what you're saying. I mean, I have to do certain things in my visit and in my documentation uh, to get to get paid. Right. right. And so it won't, um, won't even let you advance unless you've checked all the boxes. Right. Exactly. Right. And we're when we're all about treating illness, you know, I yes. mean. Nurse practitioners, I think, are, are, are much better at treating with health promotion and different options than just taking care of illness. Um, I, I totally agree, Nina. And one of the, the other things that I found that was happening consistently in, in my practice as a family nurse practitioner was there was this uber focus on symptomology. If a patient has this set of symptoms, they get this. And <clears throat> so there was a loss of understanding about why a patient suffers from osteoarthritis of a certain joint. Could it be that perhaps there was a trigger in the kinetic chain that happened many years ago that provoked this? And we lost that ability to, to look with foresight into what caused the patient to get that way to begin with. Instead, it was just, well, here we are at point B. So let's just treat from point B forward. Let's not pay attention to all of the degenerative processes that have occurred the years before that. And so that was, that was frustrating for me as well. And that's the major portion of the motivation for me to look outside of the major healthcare systems for something that's different. 
What yeah, I mean, do? our options are what? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, weight loss, and then eventually joint steroid replacement. injections, steroid, steroid injections. Oh, right, steroid injections. And there you go, Carol. Steroid injection. And if that doesn't work, you come back and do another steroid injection. Right, right, and, right. And all of my pain management colleagues will speak to this and, and they'll oh, yeah. say, oh, yeah, you know, so. Well, yeah, yeah my- those steroid injections are expensive. And quite honestly, I personally, with the patients I've treated who started down that path, sometimes you would see a benefit you know, they might get some relief for a while, but the, it, it turned into a cycle where they, they would go more and more often until eventually they had surgery. And there's risk to Absolutely. the steroid injections. There's risk, you know, can really degenerate yes. the joint and build up scar tissue, right? And so- And we know that now. Yeah, we know that now, don't we? So what made yeah. you decide to invest in um, iMac? Yeah. Well, it's- it. Uh, it it's, it wasn't a simple knee-jerk reaction, I'll tell you that much. Um, it was that, that same process that I spoke to just a few minutes ago about just trying to find a different way to feel like I was contributing to the health of my patients. And I met these guys. They had established their practice in Paducah, Kentucky. And our company was actually founded by a chiropractic physician who realized that there were certain limits to his ability to improve patients. And he suffered with some frustration as well. So he saw that when physical therapy was added to the mix, patients had better outcomes. And then he was fortunate enough. Chiropractic and then physical therapy together. Correct. And that was the first step in the integrated process for IMAC. And then shortly thereafter, and it was roughly about uh, 2009, 2010, they then added a medical provider to their integrated format as well. And at that stage, they were just doing uh, joint rehabilitation, knees, shoulders, hips, but also rehab for cervical and lumbar injuries as well. So anything that included any portion of the spine and then joints. And they began to see dramatic improvements in patient outcomes with that combination of integration. And that's where IMAC was born. And since then we have moved on. I met these guys in 2014 and realized that this was a very unique practice model. Nowhere in my experience of over 23 years as a nurse practitioner, 32 as a nurse, had I ever seen a practice that integrated physical therapy, chiropractic, and medicine all in the same facility? That is and unique. The, That's great. It, That's so it unique. Is. It's very unique. And probably one of the most unique facets of the practice was that everybody checked their ego at the door. And nice. we all contribute to plans of care for those patients. We all play certain roles in the practice but we all contribute to the patient outcomes. And I am extremely proud of the approach that we've taken since then. Um, I was, was very, very blessed in 2014 when we first started discussing uh, developing a project together. I said, you know, St. Louis is a wonderful market for this. And it was interesting how it happened. Um, we started to meet on a regular basis, just telephone calls, and I visited their practice uh, multiple times, actually worked in their practice and, and watched them do what they did. And when we started to take steps forward to establish a location and decide that St. Louis was going to be the first expansion outside of our home base of Paducah, Kentucky, I was really excited. And we started to talk about, well, what are we going to call this? What are we going to, how are we going to approach it? You know, how's the practice going to look? Is it going to be identical to what we do in Paducah? And we were very fortunate that we had taken care of Ozzie Smith in Paducah, Kentucky, of all places. Now and you're treated saying Ozzie Smith was a, was a patient. Absolutely. He was a patient. In and fact, for those who aren't in St. Louis, who's Ozzie Smith? Uh, 
Well, yeah. he's only the best shortstop <laughs> that Major League Baseball has ever seen. Ever. The, and the anybody, wizard. The wizard. Yeah, anybody from St. Louis knows Ozzie Smith. So yeah. the funny thing is you get outside of the state, and right. even – even in Kentucky, people know Ozzy Smith. Most people. So, you, did, you didn't have, have to sell him on baseball. it. Yeah, you didn't have no. to sell him on it because he knew no. the results. <clears throat> we treated his shoulders in oh. 2012 oh. with platelet-rich plasma and cellular therapies that were autologously harvested from him. And he had such good success with it, he went back it was the very first year that mike matheny had become the manager of the cardinals and he was actually invited to come to spring training and he went down and through with those young guys and wow. so we knew that he had had success we have thousands of other patients who'd had success and so it was it was a little ironic i wasn't aware that that was going to ultimately be the plan that the facilities in st louis and then Subsequently, what we've opened in Springfield, Missouri, we're all going to be named Ozzie Smith IMAC Regeneration Centers. But I went to a meeting in November of uh, 2015. Actually, I checked that. It was November of 2014 in Paducah. And I walked into this restaurant expecting to meet the guys that were the practice partners. And here was Ozzie Smith sitting at the head of this table. And I recognized him immediately being from St. Louis and, and knowing who he was. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And I, I, I kind of walked around the room. I didn't want to sit right next to him. That made it way too obvious that I was <laughs> enamored with him. And finally, everybody sat down for dinner. And he said to me, why don't you come over here and sit down? And so I sat down next to him. And he looked at me and he said, I bet you're wondering why I'm here. And I go, yeah, I really am, Ozzy. I don't know what's going on here. And the founder of the company was sitting across the table. And he said, well, he wants to be your corporate spokesperson. What do you think about that? And wow. that was a no-brainer. That was easy. Yeah, yeah that was, so, that was And then that was great. a little more irony to add to the mix was in 2016, April of 2016, when we opened our doors in St. Louis, we were about two weeks from opening. and We had all of our equipment in. We were set to go. Our staffing was all set to go. And Ozzy is an avid, avid golfer. And he traded – baseball for golf and he plays golf on a regular basis and he unfortunately herniated a disc and I'm not sharing anything HIPAA related so right. don't anybody send me any email exactly he, he lets you. us talk about this so please everybody settle down <laughs> but um, he herniated a disc in his back two weeks before we opened and he was hospitalized and there was neurosurgery consults. Everybody was trying to talk him into having surgery. And he was very honest and said, you know what? I've played baseball with too many guys who've had back surgery and now can't function. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let my guys take care of me first. And we did so. And I am proud to say that to this day, he has not needed back surgery. And we wow. continue to treat him on a wellness basis. And the guy plays golf three to four times a week. Wow. And he's one of our he's one of our best success stories along with thousands of other patients. So well, and you're yeah. doing research too, right? We just uh, recently, this past year in 2020, had our first FDA approved clinical research study to establish the safety and efficacy of umbilical cellular therapy in regard to Brady dyskinesias. Wow. So patients who have Parkinson's disease and other hybrids oh, wow. of, of Brady dyskinesias, and it's a safety study. It's only 15 patients, and we are enrolling them across all our centers across the Midwest. And so far, we've treated five patients. Uh, we're very encouraged, and we're very hopeful that uh, we will be able to clearly establish the safety of umbilical products with Brady dyskinesias. But then from that, we'll build onto the efficacy studies, enlarge the N, and begin to gain more and more strength. Wow. So now you do the plasma enrichment therapy, and I understand that you take blood from the patient, yes. like a transfusion, like, a, you know, like they were donating their own blood, right? And then you, you spin that down to get the, plat the platelets 
and that's yes. what's being injected back. Now, what about the umbilical therapy? Is that stem yeah, what, cell? Well, there are two different two different scenarios. So let me just kind of briefly talk about regenerative medicine as a whole. <clears throat> there are different phases to regenerative medicine, and what we know now is vastly different than what we thought we knew in 2009. Platelet-rich plasma, there's no enrichment that we do to it, and the FDA will not let you enrich any products like that, and these meet the standards of the FDA for minimal manipulation and same-day processing. So what we've come to understand about platelet-rich plasma is that the human body has the ability to heal. And if you do not believe that the human body has the ability to heal, then I need you to explain to me how a surgical wound can heal and sutures or staples can be removed and you still have that capacity to heal. You can remove a gallbladder and a person's GI tract will still function. So the human body possesses that unique capability to heal. And what we do is simply harvest what God has blessed us all with and treat it in such a manner that it's concentrated. So there are growth factors. There's six distinct growth factors that are carried with the platelets. And we were all taught in pathophysiology that the platelets play a role in the hematopoietic system, particularly right. with clotting. Right. But that's not all that the platelets do. Hmm. They're also very hmm. unique in that they have the ability to self-activate themselves in the presence of inflammation, and they play a significant role with the immune system in modulating inflammation downward, hmm. very differently from steroids, yeah. but they do the same type of thing. Platelets are the first responders to the inflammatory process or the traumatic process. Platelets go to the area, they activate themselves, they, they create that fibrinous mesh network to catch right. red blood cells, create okay. a clot if that's what's necessary. But the part that we seldom talk about in a and classes is that the platelets also have this function of recruitment for other cells and the modulation of inflammation downward. So when we harvest platelets, what we're harvesting is a blood draw. And we take approximately a 60 cc blood draw, we mix it with just a little bit of sodium citrate as an anticoagulant, and then we place it into tubes <clears throat> that are separated and then put into a centrifuge. Mm -hmm. So there's no enhancement, there's no uh, additional medication or product that's put into it. It's your own blood with a little bit of anticoagulant so it doesn't create a clot in a tube. And then it's spun down in a centrifuge and that process of spinning it drives the red cells to the bottom of the tube and leaves the serum layer. And in the lower third of that serum layer is where the platelets get spun down to because of their density. Hence, platelet-rich plasma. Okay. We're harvesting a simple portion of the plasma that contains the most platelets in it. Typically, when we centrifuge it, we're able to get concentrations that are anywhere from three to five times greater than what your bloodstream carries. Hence, we're also enhancing the natural growth factors that are there, the content, the quantity, quantity of the growth factors, and the natural anti-inflammatory factors that are carried in the body. Now, those cells, because of the way that they're harvested, processed, and then immediately re-injected back into the patient, behave the same way as if your immune system had dispatched them to that point. Oh, wow. So they get to the inflammatory regions, they recognize that inflammation, and they sense it, and they open up and release and grow, dump all those growth factors in the area. So it's a very useful process. The body of literature has grown exponentially. In 2009, I could have found you a stack about that thick. Today, that stack is well over my head and has been published in multiple peer-reviewed journals. And we know that it is a valid 
and useful therapeutic modality. So the well, next question to most people. You've yeah. seen patients that it's benefited from. I mean, you've right. there's, there's come there's in. No doubt. And exactly. You, there's no you doubt. Know, when you see it and you see it works, you, you know this is something that works. So nobody can take that knowledge from you. You've, you've, you've watched it. But I bet That's there's correct. people that doubt it right and say oh Absolutely. is that some new age thing can you speak to that yes i can clearly speak to it and part of that is because of the way that our healthcare system is set up the vast majority of us that are consumers as well as healthcare providers we only think that if your insurance pays for it then it's a valid therapeutic modality Ah. And then, you know what, you hit the nail right on the head there. That is so ah. true. And so, Please. but you know what, I can speak to that right now. I can say, I can tell you the benefit of massage on a weekly basis is probably better than Ativan. Oh, definitely. And most people would say, yeah, insurance doesn't cover massage therapy. But it has a relaxing effect on you. So, of course, but you're right. We don't think of valid medical procedures if insurance doesn't pay for it. That's nope. it. That's it. And the other side of that coin is as providers, we're all programmed to only discuss with patients what those modalities that? which right. are covered by insurance, which right. is not the right way to think about things right. particularly in this format now don't get me wrong i am not advocating that if you have coronary atherosclerosis to the point that you have chest pain every day that you should not seek care that's not what i'm saying but think about the modalities for coronary atherosclerosis that were here in the 1980s, mm -hmm. Carol, when we were nurses fresh out of nursing school, we didn't have the kinds of stints that oh, exist no. today. A, a, a wonderful example is vascular surgery. Yes. How many vascular surgeons today still do open procedures? Well, mm -mm. if mm -mm. you're talking to a vascular surgeon that's under 50 in age nope. those guys are doing 80% yeah. endovascularly endovascular so, yeah, yeah my, my point is that technology has changed evidence grows and we know that what we thought was true about certain treatments and therapies has changed dramatically and with regenerative medicine so many providers, whether they're orthopedic pain management guys, it doesn't matter. They were programmed so many years ago to only offer what insurance covers. So, right. you know, when we're dealing with patients, there's a lot of times where, you know, I get pushback from patients who say, well, I went to my pain management doctor, I went to my orthopedist, and they said, what you do really doesn't work. So then I have to say, well, okay, let's review so you've had a lumbar decompression laminectomy and you went back three years later and you had two vertebrae fused with oh. rods and screws. Oh, and gosh. now three years later, you're back with the same exact pain. So how did so that did it you? work? How did it work yeah. for you? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, we're not and going so, in the right direction there. Which, correct. So, it, it takes a lot of education. Absolutely. Where So... Where do you think this will lead? So if you get, I mean, I'm assuming if you're doing these trials and you're getting FDA approval, and research. that would lead to more acceptance, quote unquote, um, and, and uh, validation. And eventually, yes. hopefully, unfortunately, it always comes down to will insurance hopefully pay for it? Yes. Is, that, is that what you're thinking? Expensive has to be well, better cost-wise. It, it is, but here's, here's how you have to think about it. And this is a battle that um, many of us at IMAC have, have tried.
tried to battle for some years in trying to convince insurance companies to look at therapeutic modalities like platelet-rich plasma, cellular therapies, even the integrated processes that we offer, trying to convince them that they do have a valid place. It does take time. Nothing happens overnight. But ask yourself this question. If patients knew that they had a choice that was surgical versus non-surgical, how many of them would exercise a non-surgical option before they chose the surgical option? Many, many, yeah. many patients. I, mean, I, I agree. don't see that so, side to trying it. Yep. So now it becomes a math problem. Who pays for most of our health care in the United States? Well, it's insurance companies. Unfortunately, it's insurance Correct. companies. So, you know, they're not dumb. They know their statistics. They know their numbers. And I'm not saying that insurance companies are bad. We all need right. them. Otherwise, right. we would we would change dramatically the way that healthcare is delivered. And, you know, frankly, there are a lot of countries that, that you know, the cost of healthcare is significantly less, but those are socialized medicine countries. And we are not that way in the United States currently, and we have lots of choices. So, um well, and you it's have just, patients. It's, it you do have education. patients. So even though the insurance yep. company may not be paying 100% of it or any of yep. it, I mean, you obviously still have patients and they're coming and they're coming back. They are because that of the they've outcomes. Decided, they've decided that it's worth their investment. They have more movement mm -hmm. and they've been able to afford it in some way. I, yeah. I'm assuming you don't treat just all the rich people. I was just going to say, no. is, it, is, it, is there, no. are there options for patients who don't have the income for this? Because we always worry as nurses and nurse practitioners. And yeah. I'm just asking that. I mean, I, you know, I, to me, it sounds like, wow, this would be great. And I'm lucky to have the expendable income to come to you, right? right. But what about Correct. someone who needs it, who we want to refer to you or refer to your center who don't have the means? Who don't who don't have the expendable income to be able to do this and that's a wonderful question and how we handle it is we look for every avenue that we can we don't turn down patients but we do educate them that there is a cost factor and you know nobody stays in business right if you give everything away for free and you know i, I want to address this to the young people out here who say things like well, gosh, you know, if, if they were going to, to BJC or Mercy or whatever, you know, they would do their care for free. Well, if you think, if you really think those big healthcare systems will do things for free, uh, you need to kind of get a different perspective because nobody can give away care for free and stay in business. Right. Now it, it comes out although those, well, yeah, but those systems are all not-for-profits, and there's no taxes that get paid in those scenarios, and those facilities benefit from the ability to not have that over their head, so they can have some charitable cases. We work very hard at making our products affordable for patients and helping I, them find ways to pay for it, including payment plans and stretching yeah. things out and the other part of this is that oftentimes for our types of practices patients get the impression that they have to pay for everything and our integrated focus the vast majority of what we do is covered by insurance yeah your physical just thing the regenerative right? things yeah absolutely yeah, that stuff's yeah. all covered yeah. And that's still good therapeutic medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing so, wrong so, with that. Yeah. So it sounds to me when you say integrative medicine, it's not just this therapy you're talking about. It's integrating no. with, with act with, you know, what if you will, the guideline medical treatment that's available in the United States and okay. added right. integrative therapies. Uh, with your, I guess you want to say, traditional medical interventions. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. And we call ourselves, a lot of people ask, what kind of practice are you? And we term our practices as regenerative 
rehabilitation clinics because that's what we do. We are focused on not just symptomology. If you are in a practice and you are only treating pain, you are missing 50% of the equation. Pain is not the only marker that's important. In my arena of practice, you have to look at the kinetic chain and what caused what. And you have to have an understanding. The human brain is a fantastic computer. And it is constantly sorting through data that is fed back upstream through our nervous system. And it makes adjustments to our balance, our gait, our stability. And it never sends you an email and tells you that it's doing it. That's why patients who have low back pain often end up developing hip issues or knee issues because it changes your gait and vice versa. You have knee issues and hip issues, you're going to ultimately end up with low back issues. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, one of the most interesting things to me is I began to learn more about regenerative medicine and, and how our practices worked was the amazing number of patients who would come in with disc disease in their low back, but would turn out to subsequently have disc disease in their cervical spine too. And we somehow like to think in medicine that everything exists in a vacuum. If you have a knee problem, you have just a knee problem. And it just needs to be replaced, which is not the reality. You can have knee pain from other sources than bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis. You can have tendinopathies that surround the joints because of the compensatory mechanisms that the musculoskeletal system engages in to try and brace and stabilize those areas. In fact, you can link a lot of joint and neck and back issues to ligamentous instability from injury. And that instability then sets off a cascade of symptoms as well as compensatory mechanisms that the human body engages in that subsequently then creates osteoarthritis. So none of those things exist in just a vacuum. And that's why you cannot look at symptoms alone and treat off of those. That's just fascinating. It's been, it's really interesting um, what you're sharing with us and what your practice is all about. Yeah. Did you ever think you were gonna come this far as an NP? Has it been a journey worth going I, through? It has, and I, I'm a, I wanna just step into this since you opened the door, Carol, thanks. If anybody out there thinks that there is a get rich quick scheme or that you're going to develop a little dog house for an IV or you're going to develop a three-way stopcock or something like that, nothing comes without work. And in healthcare, you have to prove what you do is valid. Yep. If you don't, then you're just blowing smoke. And we have been accused so many times of blowing smoke. But what we did was we stayed in the game. We saw our outcomes. We tracked our outcomes. We have looked at the clinical literature that's there. And we have a volume and body of patients that we've now treated and have success. So, you know, it takes work. And this was not an easy thing. And, you know, I spent, gosh, Carol, um, 16, 15 years as a nurse practitioner in a primary care setting, killing myself and trying to provide for my family, but more importantly, provide for my patients and my community. Right, right. And this was, it was a great opportunity to step into, but it has not been easy. I'm talking nothing but 12 hour days. Mm -hmm. yes. And if you want to really be serious, then you know, you got to take your whole entire retirement and dump it into something. And that's wow. the part. Wow, wow, wow. That but will now... scare the crap out of you every day. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. And for those of yeah. us who are on the back side of our career wanting to yeah. retire you right. know, in less than 10 years. And exactly. when it's your money on the line. Um, right. But the exciting part and why I'm just so glad that you agree to be a part of this um, podcast is you are a nurse practitioner changing practice. Absolutely. I mean, you're really changing practice. You know, to hear you say that, it, it sounds so flattering. If that was the intent was just to to take control of my life and take control for patients and see them get better. And that was really the intent. I, you know, I had thought everything else would come with it, and it has been a it's been a, a grind, but it has been tremendously rewarding. And you know, we, there's all of these things when you start into a new business or practice that you conceive, this is how I want to set this up. This is how I want this to be. And it doesn't always go that way. So yeah. you get humbled every day. You Absolutely. get taught leadership lessons every day. And you cannot go into it like a bull in a china closet. And I can tell you that I have grown so much personally, professionally, and emotionally as I've gone through this process. Um, it hasn't been a real big financial gain, but I am independent. I'm no longer tied to a big healthcare system for my income. And the greatest thing about it, last year, we published an internal study that we did of our own outcomes. Oh, wow. We spent, oh. We spent two years tracking outcomes of our own patients. We had an in of 678 patients that we tracked for two years. We looked at their functional capabilities, and that's something that we do every single re-examination visit and every new patient visit. We have the patients fill out functional scales for their back pain, their neck pain, their extremity pain, knee pain, whatever it may be, so that you can track them yeah. functionally and see that they're improving. So we tracked those patients, 678 of them for two years, and what we found was that 81% of our patient population two years out was still receiving substantive benefit from our wow. care. That's, that so is tremendous me, outcome. Oh, that is tremendous positive. That was, outcome. Yeah. That made I don't it know. All if, I don't know of any other, I don't know of any other treatment or, or, um, part of medicine that would have those, those two amazing outcomes. Well, and, Nina, you, you know, when you think about it, if you're in oncology and you see a new oncology drug come out every year, compared to the old ones, you know, if, if you get 2% better in one area of response, that's enough for that's the FDA great. to say, yeah, that's yeah, a better that's drug. And then when it gets marketed, oh, you know, it gets pushed really hard yeah, as the and drug. it's better, but it's only 2% <laughs> better. Yeah, so, right. so for me, looking at our outcomes, I went, holy cow, this is way better than 2%. Yeah. yeah. So it and, was tremendously well, rewarding for all of us that were involved. Functionality without surgery. Oh my gosh. I think, yeah. I, think, I think personally, Doug, you guys are just at the tip of the iceberg. You're just at the tip of the iceberg. We you are. Really we really are. are. Medicine is changing. Medicine is changing. And patients are consumers. Little. Yeah, patients are consumers. Yep. They want to get better and they don't, um, they don't, you know, the thought of surgery and the potential complications of that, um, you know, patients yep. are really looking at all our alternatives. I, I see it in my patients, you know, in, in, in primary care and uh, occupational med that I'm um, in right now. I see it. Yeah. Um, I see it in my family members, you know. Uh, I think this is tremendous. Once you get that insurance to finally say, this is something we can offer, the floodgates would open for you for sure. Well, and tracking your outcomes. Yeah. We know as nurse practitioners, you you know, something yeah. you'll learn as a nurse practitioner, if you're thinking about being a nurse practitioner, you're, you're a nurse in NP school, is you have to validate your practice. Absolutely, yes. And, this, and that is so yes. important what you said, tracking outcomes in any practice is really yeah. important. It's, it's what you stand on. It's your, it's not just your reputation. It's the quality of your care. And 
you know, there's the paradigm shift. So let me present this to you. How do most typical physician practices have patients enter? And I'm not talking physically through the door. It's typically by a referral. Referral. Pattern. Yeah, that's right. true. Referral. Right. So we don't have those typical referral patterns. I would love to say that we have all of these ingrained referral patterns, but we don't. We have had to go out there and battle the marketing world with social media, with print, with radio, TV, all of those aspects, with doing dinners to attract patients, to just yeah. educate them as to what our service. I can't tell you the number of times that patients have said as a doing a new patient visit with them, I was a batting cage or a restaurant. I'm telling well, we do that if that's what you think. So it just illustrates that from traditional medicine, you know, people need education. Yeah, I think you said the key there. Um, well, Doug, I can't thank you enough uh, for being with us. Um, and I really, really hope that your business just keeps growing and uh, you get to you. finally, re you know, get reap some of the rewards from all this hard work. I really think this is a new and upcoming um, technology that if we got together another few years from now, you would be telling me all the, the wonderful I promise things that you. happen. Yeah, it's a tremendous opportunity. Go ahead, Nina. It just sounds like maybe it'll be a tremendous opportunity for nurse, nurse practitioners as well. And we yeah. as nurse practitioners want to get the word out, you know, that this yeah. is an option for patients. I, I will carry this in my practice. And hopefully even from this podcast, there'll be some more um, interest and information shared. Well, and I, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it because I always get really excited about it. And it's not something that I need to, a bunch of notes on or, or anything like that. But, you know, the amazing thing for us is, is this. If we had the opportunity to just treat all of the patients who were not surgical candidates, and think about what I'm saying to you. How many patients go to an orthopedist who have a bad set of knees but they also have heart disease, COPD, diabetes. And you know that they're, at a, they're in a population that is so high risk that you're gonna be lucky to find an anesthesiologist even wants to put them to sleep. That's right. That's, right. We, could, we could treat all of those patients. And they'd right? still have plenty to and, do surgery. Oh, on. and we would be overwhelmed. And, yeah. You know, I'm so proud of what we do and how we've grown. We started in 2016 with our first expansion outside of Paducah, Kentucky. And today, we now have 15 clinic practices. Wow. And, wow. and including all of our visits a day. So physical therapy, chiropractic, and medicine visits all in a day across all of our 15 clinics. We're over 1,800 visits a day with our 15 oh, wow. clinics. Wow. So it's just shocking to, to look at where we started. And we have tremendous leadership in our company, great vision. And we've got a really super mix of people and what they do, their intelligence, their specialty areas. And we continue to grow. And uh, we're excited about the opportunities and, and you know, we're not um, crazy, holistic, uh, off the beaten path kind no, of I, It sounds like you're well grounded. Yeah, it sounds like this you're grounded in is, real science. It's science and legitimate medicine. And, and like um, you said, there is a so. very specific population for sure that yep. you can treat and you would be overwhelmed with just that small Absolutely. percentage. Um, and we're not looking to hurt surgeons or pain medicine yeah. doctors, anything like that. We're just there to provide care to patients who are interested in the kinds of services that we offer. And we have a, a keen understanding that the 21st 
traditional methods in which we used have become outdated. We don't say that other providers are not clinically based or grounded because of the methods that they choose, but we are definitively clinically grounded in what we base our treatments on and most importantly, our outcomes. That's awesome. Doug, thank you, Doug. Thank you, so, thank you so much. It was great um, to talk with you guys. So we're, we're, uh, we're really excited to put this podcast up and we hope that a lot of uh, new nurses and are gonna gain a lot of good information. Doug, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Hey, thank you ladies. And listen, I am so excited about the commitment that both of you have to training our young nurses and nurse practitioners. Oh, thank you. Know, this you. has been a, a 2020 was a hardcore year for all of us. Yeah. And so many of our young nurses were really there in the trenches, grinding yeah. it out every day. And I just want to acknowledge those people. And yeah. I want to encourage you that, hey, man, you guys keep at it. We're all at it. We all contribute to healthcare. And the value of nurses opinions matters in healthcare today it does it's a different environment and so thank you for training them and and i look forward to talking to you guys more in the future thanks doug great to meet right. you we Bye. wish you the right. best thank you see you later